In 2014, the U.S. held the first U.S. Africa Summit with African leaders in Washington, D.C., under President Barack Obama. Eight years later, on December 13, 2022, incumbent President Joe Biden hosted the second three day U.S. Africa Summit, to which 50 African leaders were invited. This was followed by a 10 day trip to Africa by U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on January 17, 2023. This series of heavyweight diplomatic moves signals a renewed U.S. relationship with Africa, with the greatest force behind it being to counteract the Chinese Communist Party or CCP's penetration of the African continent. Prior to Yellen's trip to Africa on January 16, 2023, China's new foreign minister, Qin Gang, concluded a visit to five African countries. These five countries are Ethiopia, Gabon, Benin, Angola, Egypt, and the headquarters of the African Union and the Arab League. China's official media, Xinhua, reported that this was the 33rd consecutive year that China's foreign minister had chosen Africa as the first stop on the New Year's visit, reaffirming the deep traditional friendship between China and Africa. Ethiopia, known as the Horn of Africa and the anchor of the region, is the second most populous country on the continent and the hub of the CCP's Belt and Road projects in Africa. Egypt, the third largest economy in Africa and home to the headquarters of the Arab League, is one of the most frequently visited countries by China's foreign ministers over the years. According to the China Africa Cooperation Forum in Egypt, the Belt and Road Initiative is in deep alignment with Egypt's Vision 2030. We are ready to conduct cooperation in major projects with Egypt, import more quality products from Egypt, and encourage more Chinese investments in Egypt. We discussed the China Arab State Summit that took place in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. We, as the Arab League, announced that we will go ahead and implement all the agreed recommendations, projects, forums, and activities in all fields. China is ready to work with the Arab League to execute the initiatives by the China Arab State Summit and work hand in hand to build a Chinese Arab community for a common, bright future together. Among these five countries, Angola, Gabon, and Benin have relatively weak relations with the CCP, but have close, deep ties with the U.S. and other countries in Europe. All three countries are in urgent need of foreign aid. Angola, located in southwest Africa, is the most important trade partner and oil supplier of the U.S. in Africa, as well as the largest aid partner of the EU to Africa. Gabon, in central Africa, is one of the top U.S. partner countries in Africa, and the two countries have held many joint military exercises. Benin, located in Western Africa, has long received a lot of aid from Western countries and attaches great importance to maintaining relations with France, the U.S., and other Western powers. During his visit to Africa, Chinese Foreign Minister Qin Gang said on a high note that China has signed debt relief agreements or reached a consensus on debt relief with 19 African countries, the largest amount of debt relief among the G20 members. China is committed to helping Africa reduce the debt burden and actively participates in the G20 Debt Service Suspension Initiative. We have signed with most African countries on debt suspension and relief. We are working with countries to deal with the individual cases concerning Ethiopia, Chad, and Zambia. China has announced the exemption, the intergovernmental interest free loans that expired at 2021 for African countries and will transfer $10 billion worth of SDRs in the IMF to developing countries. His remark sparked a public outcry in China, which condemned the CCP for throwing money around in Africa when it couldn't even afford Pfizer's antiviral medicines. They are in urgent need as the virus tsunami sweeps through China. Qin Gong stressed that China doesn't see the African continent as a battleground between the West and Beijing. In reality, Africa is significant to the CCP as an invaluable diplomatic tool to break out of its international isolation. In 1956, Egypt was the first African country to have established diplomatic relations with the Red Regime of the CCP.
During the Cultural Revolution, when the economy came to a standstill, the CCP still used its national resources to provide economic aid to Africa. In 1971, this Red Regime replaced the Republic of China in the UN, and African countries cast a crucial vote of support, one-third of the vote, in the process. Consequently, many African countries still gravitate to the CCP on major issues without principle. From 1999 to 2002, the CCP manipulated such third world allies to have successfully blocked U.S. motions on the deteriorating human rights situation in China at the UN Commission on Human Rights. And these countries later used their votes to kick the U.S. out of the UN Commission on Human Rights so that the U.S. could no longer have a voice. By the time Xi Jinping came to power, the CCP was increasingly isolated in the international community. The current Beijing government's increased penetration and control of Africa can strengthen its hand against Europe and the U.S. From the 1990s and especially into the 21st century, Beijing has significantly increased its economic interests in Africa. In addition to maintaining its original political interests, such as votes in international organizations, the African continent also possesses the cheap labor, natural resources, and strategic military locations that Beijing needs to achieve its ambitions of becoming a great world power. Western countries such as the U.S. can't compete on a level playing field regarding environmental, human rights, and labor conditions with the Chinese Communist Party. After Xi Jinping became president, he launched a Belt and Road economic strategy in 2013 to export China's excess capacity primarily in infrastructure projects such as hydropower, airports, ports, and railways. By the end of 2021, out of 53 African countries which China has diplomatic relations, 52 countries, as well as the AU Commission, have signed cooperation documents with China for the joint construction of One Belt, One Road. According to a study published by the U.S. think tank Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in mid-May 2022, China's economic footprint in Africa has now far surpassed that of the U.S. China's trade with the African continent exceeded 250 billion U.S. dollars in 2021, making it the largest trading partner of many African countries. In comparison, the U.S. trade with Africa was only 64.3 billion U.S. dollars. That is to say, the CCP's economic dominance in Africa is currently evident in comparison. However, critics argue that the economic benefits haven't benefited the local people, but have instead been lost to the corruption of small groups. The CCP has not only invested in Africa to export corruption, but also has trouble guaranteeing the quality of its projects. In January, the Wall Street Journal reported that many of the CCP's Belt and Road infrastructure projects had serious flaws in their construction including a giant hydroelectric power plant in Ecuador, which cost $2.7 billion U.S. dollars. Ecuador's National Electricity Company says officials have found more than 17,000 cracks in the plant's eight turbines since it began operations in 2016. The officials believe that these cracks are from faulty steel imported from China. In 2021, the company sued Sino Hydro Corporation in an international arbitration court in Chile. The case is now being heard. This has raised fears that the largest power plant in Ecuador may collapse. This hydroelectric power plant is believed to have plunged Ecuador into a deeper debt crisis. Previously, China Development Bank agreed to finance 85% of the initial cost of the hydropower plant with an interest rate of 6.9%. Sino Hydro was responsible for the construction and hundreds of Chinese workers were flown in to build the plant between 2010 and 2016. The former energy minister of Ecuador and former secretary general of the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries said, The problems we have today are due to the poor quality of equipment and parts in the projects built by China. According to a 2021 document from the Johns Hopkins University China Africa Studies Initiative, in Africa, more than 60% of the revenue received by major international contractors in 2019 went to Chinese companies. Chinese construction companies are often awarded these government projects or they approach local officials directly, promising them easy access to financing from Chinese banks. But now low-quality construction threatens to cripple their infrastructure and leave African countries with more costs in the coming years to remedy the problem. Also in Pakistan, for example, officials shut down the Neelam Jalam hydropower plant last year after detecting cracks in a water transmission tunnel. Pakistani officials said in November 2022 that they feared the tunnel would collapse after four years of use at the plant. 
The plant's closure has added about 44 million U.S. dollars to Pakistan's monthly power costs since July, according to regulators. Uganda's power producer, meanwhile, said it has identified more than 500 construction defects in a Chinese-built 183-megawatt hydropower plant on the Nile. This power station has been failing frequently since it went into operation in 2019. The power plant cost 567.7 million U.S. dollars to build, mainly through a 480 million U.S. dollar loan from the Export-Import Bank of China. Another Chinese-built hydropower plant on the Lower Nile was completed three years behind schedule. Ugandan officials have attributed the delays to various construction defects, including cracked walls. Chinese contractors also installed faulty cables, switches, and fire suppression systems that must be replaced. Earlier this year, the government has already had to repay a $1.44 billion US dollar loan from the Export-Import Bank of China, but the plant isn't yet operational. These types of examples are commonplace. Many Chinese projects have been detrimental to the African ecosystem as well. Moreover, the outside world has noted the CCP's infiltration of African media. Freedom House, an international human rights organization based in Washington, D.C., published the report, Beijing's Global Media Influence, in 2022. The report points out that the Chinese government has been actively expanding its influence over various media outlets around the globe since 2019, shifting foreign opinion in favor of China and suppressing and bullying media and voices critical of the Chinese government. The Chinese government invites African journalists to train in China so that they can write favorable articles about China when they return home. For example, when the U.S. House Speaker Pelosi visited Taiwan, the tensions in the international community were so high that the international media covered the event heavily. African media, however, didn't talk much about this matter because African countries such as South Africa, Algeria, and Kenya only report news favorable to China. China helped establish a 10,000 satellite TV reception project in Africa in 2022, which has enabled rural Africa to receive China-biased news content. The U.S.-China tussle kicking off in January 2023 has focused on the debt problems of African countries. The CCP has provided loans to many low-income African countries, thus becoming a significant creditor in Africa. However, the specific terms of the loans provided and the collateral required from African countries have not been transparent to the public. The reality is China is the largest creditor of developing countries, many of which have fallen into debt crises. According to the World Bank, the world's poorest countries face 35 billion US dollars in debt payments to creditors in both the official and private sectors in 2022, of which more than 40% is owed to China. Debt is a constraint on China's economic development, but the CCP has also used the debt crisis to exert a great deal of influence over debtor countries, including Africa. Since the last administration, the U.S. has repeatedly denounced Chinese loans to African countries as a debt trap. Yellen has also repeatedly criticized Beijing, the world's largest creditor, for not moving more quickly to restructure the debts of poor African countries. In a January 14th interview with NPR, Yellen said her visit to Africa aimed at deepening economic ties with Africa. She acknowledged the CCP's penetration in providing loans to African countries and trade with Africa. However, African leaders made clear at the December 2022 U.S.-Africa summit that they were seeking greater U.S. involvement. In 2020, Zambia defaulted on its debt, failing to make a 42.5 million US dollar bond payment, becoming the first African country to default during the COVID-19 epidemic. The country now owes a total of 17 billion US dollars in foreign debt, and China is its largest creditor. Zambia has been trying to reach an agreement with the CCP to restructure its debt, and its negotiations on how to deal with the debt loads have been ongoing. But little progress has been made so far, a situation that has left local people in poverty and unemployment. Zambia is an inland country larger than the state of Texas, rich in copper, and the majority of its population lives on less than two US dollars a day. Other debt-ridden countries in Africa are closely watching Zambia's debt restructuring progress. According to Reuters, economic analysts say some African countries, including Zambia, are unhappy with the loans provided by the CCP and are looking for alternatives. Addressing Zambia's debt problems is a major reason for Yellen's trip to Africa, where she met with the Zambian president and finance minister on January 24th to discuss the ongoing negotiations. At a press conference, Yellen called out to China for an immediate solution to Zambia's heavy debt burden as the issue is critical. 
She said that although she had a constructive conversation with Chinese Vice Premier Liu He in Switzerland the week before about Zambia's debt, it has taken too long to resolve the issue. I believe the United States believes that it is critically important for Zambia to be able to restructure its debt, and it's critically important to um, allow Zambia to finance and make the investments that will be necessary and required to promote economic growth and sustainable development. I am encouraged that progress may become possible shortly. Let me say I know that the Chinese have been um, a barrier to concluding the negotiations. I recently met with my Chinese counterpart uh, just a few days ago in Zurich, and I specifically raised the issue of Zambia and asked for their cooperation in trying to reach a speedy resolution. We were in a debt situation before, which was resolved about 15 years ago through multilateral actions. Unfortunately, through our own um, deeds, we brought back the issue of the debt and sustainability. But that's the reality, and uh, we as a government, we do not shy away from admitting that there was a problem. They are very skeptical. The Biden administration uh, for reading the people in the Zambian US relationship. Zambian president said in a bilateral meeting with Yellen that the country faces a deadline to repay its debt in late March. It will further drag on the economy and a solution must be found soon. Yellen was speaking in Lusaka, Zambia's capital city, which is dominated by Chinese financing. Facilities expanded with Chinese funds in 2015 are visible at the local international airport. Billboards with Chinese logos and newly built companies can be seen throughout the city, attesting to Beijing's growing influence and competition with the U.S. Earlier, on January 20th, Yellen spoke about Africa's vast potential and prospects for the continent during a speech in Dakar, the capital of Senegal, a West African country. She said there is still much work to be done to address the many challenges facing Africa and the globe, but that Africa will determine the future of the global economy. She pointed out that Africa's population boom can create tremendous economic opportunities. It has the talent and resources to develop global industries and drive global innovation. In other words, Africa's success will mean success for all of us. She said it was this potential of Africa that prompted the Biden administration to develop a new strategy for sub-Saharan Africa. Our engagement is not transactional, it's not for show, and it's not for the short term. The United States is here as a partner to help Africa realize its massive economic potential. Yellen also said in Dakar that President Biden, Vice President Harris, and several cabinet secretaries will visit Africa this year. Africa will shape the future of the global economy. And I explained that the United States is ready to work with Africa as an equal partner. We know that a thriving Africa is in the interest of the United States. A thriving Africa means a larger market for our goods and services. It means more investment opportunities for our businesses. I believe that Ms. Yellen and I will have fruitful discussion today on a number of issues, including anti-money laundering and countering finance, financing of terrorism, climate financing, sovereign debt resolution in Africa, and other global issues which are going to be part of the G20 next month. At the U.S.-Africa Leaders Summit last December, the U.S. pledged to provide at least $55 billion in aid to Africa over the next three years. It also signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area to expand trade between the two entities. Some analysts argue that the tug-of-war between major powers is a fact of life on a global scale, but it is no more acute in Africa than in other parts of the world. We find that this perception lacks a basic understanding of the character of the CCP. Last August, in the document U.S. Strategy Towards Sub-Saharan Africa, it said, 
The People's Republic of China, PRC, by contrast, sees the region as an important arena to challenge the rules-based international order, advance its own narrow commercial and geopolitical interests, undermine transparency and openness, and weaken U.S. relations with African peoples and governments. The U.S., the EU, and the G7 countries have all launched major investment programs in developing Africa to compete with the CCP's Belt and Road Project, offering African countries another option. Against these backdrops, Africa has become a focal point of global strategic competition between China and the U.S. This means, to some extent, that African countries are facing a choice on whether to continue to support the Red CCP. Some of them have already joined the global trend of blocking it.